Dear Eve Gok, Dina August, Falcha, good day, a cod of Brehov is Misha, Grieving off Flanagan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Brehan Academy. I am Kevin Flanagan. And in this episode, I'm joined by a very special guest. Uh, I pri feel privileged to be able to have this conversation. Martin Breen is from Ennis in County Clare, and he has dedicated over 40 years of his life to researching Irish heritage, not just researching, but also making his research available to the public. I first got in touch with Martin when he reached out to me after the series on the Brehan Academy on the story of an Irish sept, because Martin has actually republished that and other books in 1999. But before we jump into it, the aim of the Brehan Academy is to help promote and revive the awareness for the laws, mythology, and the heritage of early Ireland. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, then I invite you to tickle the like button, smash subscribe, and ring the bell. Also to check out the brehanacademy.org website for more information and for more resources about early Irish heritage. Now, with that being said, let's jump into the conversation with Martin Breen on the castles and tower houses of Ireland. Martin, thanks first of all for agreeing to give me this talk. Uh, we've finally managed to get our schedules to match up after a couple of hectic weeks, especially from my side, escaping from Ukraine. Okay. But I've been really looking forward to having this conversation. Um, you and I first kind of connected as a result of the video series I put up on Story of an Irish Sept, and you reached out yeah. to me about that. Uh, and you made me aware of something that I didn't know that you've actually worked on republishing the story of an Irish sept many years ago, I think it was 1999. And yes. it wasn't the only book that you worked on. I know you've, you've done a lot of work on the origins of the O'Brien clan as well. So I think that might be a nice place just to kick things off. If you maybe you just want to talk a little bit about um, what, what encouraged you, what inspired you to, to put your time into working on republishing these books. Um, Okay, if we bring it back to a start, I suppose I was always interested in counties, uh, the county's castles, and I started researching them. And then you find that in the past, if we go back to when, when I was uh, your age, <coughs> that um, these books weren't available. And to get to get a copy of the story of an Irish set at the time, um, you couldn't take it out of a library. But you could go in and, and, and study parts of it. We didn't have iPhones, so we couldn't photograph the pages. So it was all very labor intensive. So I said, you know, it might be an idea to um, actually republish it. And I looked into republishing it. And I eventually tracked down a copy for it cost a good few hundred pounds at the time because there weren't too many left and there weren't too many issued. And I published about 2000 copies. I think there's about 25 or 30 left. So I, I'm nearly at the end of them. But um, I didn't do them as to make money out of them. I did them simply to get them out there. Now they have paid for themselves. They didn't cost me any money, but I most certainly wouldn't be retiring on them. So yeah. I did the story of an Irish sept because uh, it dealt with one sept or family, which was the McNamaras. And that was by uh, Nottage Charles McNamara. And he published that in 1896. So when I got my hands on that, got it republished, uh, I went to people um, who would have like-minded people like ourselves and said if i published this book i'll put your name in the front cover if you pay me 20 or 30 quid which is really only the price of the book was it was really just a guarantee that a number would would, would um, move on and you wouldn't be left with a bill of of, of several grand and it, it worked it worked perfectly but i most certainly wouldn't like to be trying to publish and live off of books but i i did enjoy the experience of publishing to have them back because the amount of people from even for yourself from the far side of the world and these books in general go to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, Germany, Europe, and of course Ireland, England. They, they, you know they travel quite a bit. So, I mean, everybody that wants to get a copy of the Irish Sept has got them, or more or less. So then, of course, I saw another book which had a lot of detail on what I was researching, which would be the family of the O'Briens and their castles. And that was published in 1860 by um, John O'Donoghue. So I said, if I get my hands 
a copy of that and I did that and I published that and then I published another one of the McNamara books and then I I, I had other publications I did a copy I, I remember when I was in Bunratty Castle that had no uh, tourist guide and I said it would be nice to have a hand sized book just something you can shove in your pocket so I did that that was a, a history of of, of, of um, Bunratty Castle and I did um, a walking guide in the history of Doolan as well because I play a bit of music and I love music and nobody could tell you, well, where does that road go to? Or what's that house? Or what's that building? What's that castle? What's that church? So I just did a, a short piece on that. That was my pastime. And I, I just, the ball kept rolling and I kept going yeah. with it. And every time you turn around and you say, God, I'm going to publish all these. And suddenly then another project comes, like what I mentioned to you today. Yeah, you were showing me this. Give, a us, a look, give us a look at that book. It looks yeah. amazing. The volume of, of escaped um, tome and records from the six. This one is dated 1680. So I'm transcribing that at the moment, which I said, God, that would be a nice job to do. And I said, if I spend a week or two at it, but it's actually about, uh, it'll be four months work to transcribe every page and type yeah. it up. And, and the county library in Ennis own it. They gladly gave me a loan of it to transcribe it. So the whole lot will go up on the Clare County Library website, which I must say, if anybody, and you're aware of it yourself, but anyone listening, if they're looking to do any sort of research on County Clare in particular, you'd never get out of that website once you go into it because <laughs> everything is in it, everything and anything, even yeah. the story of an Irish septic, certain, certain parts of it. So, I mean, there is loads of, of material there for, 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 uh, for research and yeah. Going back to the research again, then in the publications, um, I mentioned to you about the other Clare, which is this one, which is the volume of the Shannon Archaeological Society published every year. This is volume 45, which is last year, and 46 is with the printers at the moment. So I publish my work in this in general. So I, I've been doing it uh, since volume five. So there's about 40 years uh, consecutive wow. papers on the castles. And yeah. as I said to you, I've covered half the castles now at this stage. So once I reach about 120 years of age, I'll have the rest of finished. Yeah. And I've, I've seen your body of work. Um, it's quite impressive. And we're going to uh, dive a little bit into that now shortly. But something you said to me in one of the first messages, and you kind of hinted it, uh, to it here again, is that you're doing this to get the information out to people. Why, yeah. is, why is that important to you? Like, why are you somebody who's decided to dedicate many years of their life to researching and making this information more available to members of the public? I suppose it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you, you do it really to have the information there because you know that when you go looking for the information yourself, it's not there. So you, you trawl through it and you research and you write it up and you say, well, it's going to be there for the next person and it's going to be there for the next person. And as, as people who do research say, and, and it's, it's an old saying, and it's, it's a very true one, that we only stand on the shoulders of the people who went before us. So you build on their research, and somebody will build on my research. And, yep. I mean, I have, I have completed the work. Uh, my, my, my colleague, Dick, Dick Cronin, Richard, um, he does the archaeological assessments of the castles. I do the historical research of the castles. And we, uh, we had most of it done, and... The Office of Public Works approached us in the 2010 uh, to know if we had a certain amount of information on this castle, this castle or this one. And I said, well, it's actually almost finished. So that kind of forced our hands. So we, between 2010 and 2014, we, we really pushed the boat out and we actually finished the body of work on the County Clare Castles. And in the meantime, then all these other little side projects come in, like writing for the other Clare or publishing a book or uh, transcribing a manuscript or you know so to try and actually get uh, all the information there into a book is not going to happen today or tomorrow so we said you know if the office of public works are happy to sponsor our work and put it up there it is now all there online so if you pick any castle out of the top of your head um, in county clare and you go into the historic environment maps and we can show show how to do that on a slide uh, if we go into the historic environment maps, all our reports are there. So the reports are there on every cast in Count Clare. So, so that was our that was so our, our our body of work. You're kind of doing the the heavy work so that other people can have a closer connection and more easily able to access information about um, yeah. their heritage, their history, and you have a particular focus on the castles and the townhouses. Yeah. Um, Tower houses, yeah. Th yeah. So so. 
anybody who's visited Ireland will be struck by the amount of castles. I, my family house is in Balbriggan and I have Braemar Castle literally across the street from me there. And it's something you grow up with and you kind of just, you take it for granted yeah, because, because you're yeah. from here, you know. Um, when you travel to other countries, you realize that the castles of that age are not as common as they are in Ireland. And yeah. when you do a deeper dive into the Irish history, you realize that the early Irish didn't necessarily live in castles. They had very different types of homes and there was like roundhouses and crannogs and things like that. So maybe that's a nice place yeah. to kind of kick things off. And um, I know you have some slides there you want to go through as well. Um, yeah. I guess, how did these types of buildings come to be known in Ireland and how did they come to be so, um, so many of them in the country? Well, um, Ireland has, I did a count for a lecture I, I did recently for the clans of Ireland. I actually did a paper on, on their, in, in their anthology, which is, I think it's their third anthology of uh, material, which would be of interest to anyone researching Ireland. Uh, it's called, it's simply called the clans of Ireland anthology. So I did a paper on that and I did a full count of the castles in, in Ireland to see exactly how many because there's so many different numbers and so many different experts are coming out with them so i've actually counted them on the ground and i am coming up with a figure of four and a half thousand so four thousand five hundred castles are as we know them tower houses because they were a house built in the shape of a tower um they were built in a period of about 200 or maybe 250 years from about let's say 1400 up to about 1640 1650 so the main body would be 1450 to 1630 or 40 and you have maybe 10 or 20 years on either side so about 250 years and they just became common and they're not um unknown outside ireland because they're also i won't say very common but there, there's quite an amount of them in england most especially in in scotland you also have the tower house style in europe but not many you have the grand the, the larger chateaus and that and and and, and, and the day uh, of the same era or, sorry no they're a little yeah. later i think are they the continental yeah, all, all, yeah much much later for the for the larger chateaus but there are earlier castles i mean the, the castle uh building started with the normans and if we go back to when the normans came to ireland in 1169 uh, from the period of about 1200 until until they were expelled sometime after the 1318 battle in, in the SRD, they built a lot of castles. They started off with the Martin Bailey and then they put in, the Martin Bailey was a, a fast thrown up defence. Then they started the stone castles. So the first stone castle in, in County Clare was in at Bunratty and the Normans actually built four castles in uh, County Clare at different stages but they were only a, a short uh, period and a small number when the Irish uh, eventually left their homesteads which were the ring forts and the Cranogs and as you know we have the stone ring forts we have the earthen ring forts all exactly the same they go back to the back to the Iron Age and um, most most of them were their, their farmsteads of, of the families the Irish eventually adopted the form of, of, of house, which became known as the Tower House, mostly through the um, building, uh, the stone buildings or the stone constructions of the Anglo-Normans. And as you know, the Anglo-Normans came into England uh, a couple of hundred years, nearly a thousand years before that, and they came from France. So really what we have is we have a building that came from France through England into Ireland and then was adapted by our own people in the later medieval period in starting it. Uh, we have done uh, quite an amount of, of, of dating. And if you want to talk about dating, our castles at some stages can be dated physically because they have date stones. And quite, quite an amount of County Clare castles have date stones. The other way you can date the castle then is to um, do the research, which is what I've spent the last several decades that and that the, you, you look into your records and you see well what's the earliest reference here the latest reference and you can put a date on the castle and say well we know it was in existence between 1450 and 1619 that kind of a date but scientifically we can now date the castles and that was another project uh, an aside again that i took on in 2017 
it ran into about maybe two years, so it was finished in 2019. I radiocarbon dated about um, 26 or 28 castles in uh, County Clare. And so scientifically, we can say that this castle was built in a period, usually a radiocarbon date would give you a couple of decades. So it would be probably from maybe 1480 to 1530, that kind of thing, maybe 30 to 40 years, because we can, you, you, uh, will I, do, you, do you understand where the radiocarbon comes from, the dating, the, the scientific I, I'm process. familiar with it, but I'm not actually sure how it works. Yeah. Maybe you can enlighten us a little bit about the actual process. Yeah, just, yeah I'm not a chemist, but... But I, just just as 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 um how it how it actually why why we can do it is because um you have uh, limestone which is calcium carbonate um when you you have you have what's known as the carbon isotopes uh so you have an isotope is just simply a different form of carbon so you have carbon 12 13 14 up to carbon 22. Carbon-14 can be radiocarbon dated. Our bodies have carbon-14 in them, which we take in from the oxygen, uh, from, the, uh, from the air, the carbon, ca the carbon dioxide in the air comes in, and we take carbon into our bodies and we're mostly carbon. Trees are carbon. So we can date anything that was once alive, because while you're alive, you're interacting with the atmosphere and you're taking in carbon dioxide, and your body has a specific amount of carbon-12, 13, 14, etc. And we're only interested in the 14 because 14, once you die, starts to radioactively decay at a specific rate. So carbon-12 is also in your body, which doesn't really, um, you compare both and you see how much. And the thing about radiocarbon is that it's what's known as a half-life of 5,700 years. So you can actually uh, date something which was once alive. It could be an animal, it could be a person, it could be a tree, um, anything that once absorbed oxygen and took in carbon dioxide so there you can actually date it I have a that's, question that's, there, the, then. that's the bones of, of, of radiocarbon so we can date anything that's been alive but castles yeah. were not alive yeah. so how does the process then work in relation to castles therein therein lies lies a, a good question <clears throat> now what you can say is um well limestone is not living but limestone has carbon and we can actually now date, and I did a couple of dates on the mortar, because when the mortar dries, during the process of drying, the mortar uh, loses its water. If you can just think of what cement is like, so it's, it's a wet, um, gungy piece of whatever. And when it dries, it becomes solid. So it turns back into rock. So all that has happened there, and it's a, it's a chemical reaction, all that has happened there is that the water that was in the plaster or the mortar or the lime mortar which they used at the time the water evaporated and left and as it left it drew back in the carbon dioxide and within the carbon dioxide you are back to your carbon 14 again and now we can date the carbon 14 that's in the lime that's in the mortar but in general when we're dating um, castles we look for something organic as in uh, a piece of timber a piece of a twig and the great thing about the tower house just one example of the dating is that the roofs and the ceilings were all uh, thrown or sprung on timber um, and usually on wicker mats. So I would usually find a piece of wicker and it would be about the size of the biro, that much. Piece of A piece of a twig that was once alive, but once the tree was cut down, it died. So it started losing its carbon-14 and we measure how much is left. And by, by finding out how much is left, we can say, well, that tree died in. So there isn't much point in, in, in radiocarbon dating um, an oak and uh, furniture because it, it might be from a tree that was 600 years old. Yeah. But what you do, what you want to date is you want to date something that's very small. So, you know, the, the twigs and the saplings that were used in the construction of the, of the, the vaults of the castles it could have been two to five to ten years old. Yeah. And no more. That was but going to be the next question. At, <laughs> yeah, you weren't looking at five, six, seven or eight hundred year old oak. So you really don't radiocarbon date something. You can, but it's not going to give you anything. Going to give you any it's going to give you a very, very broad spectrum. Whereas the, the, the one or two or five year old sapling will give you a, pre, a reasonably narrow 
maybe two decades about, you know so that's that's really how we do it now it's i mean i i would send my my samples to most of my samples were done in queen's university in belfast so they would be sent up there and to be quite honest with you doing the sampling and taking the samples is quite easy and a very slow or very quick process the slow process is the bloody paperwork because you have to get uh, permission from the national monuments to go and take the sample then you you have to get permission from the government to export the sample because you're exporting an artifact and by the time you get all that done and then you have to get funding to get the samples done and then the sample goes to Belfast and they give you back your your, your certificate of date that's for the trees that's for the twigs but as I said we got martyr samples done as well and the martyr samples are done in Aarhus University in Denmark because their their, their speciality is uh, extracting the carbon from the martyr and it, it's it's extracted into a vial in in a vacuum and then that vacuum uh, holds the carbon 14 and that's simply radiocarbon data again in a mass spectrometer the same system yeah. just a different preparation so so i have another question then just based on your research do you know or have you been able to identify what are the oldest castles in ireland well i can identify the oldest castle in County Clare, because the earliest layer of carbon that we got was for a castle called Dangany Viggan in uh, Quinn, and it came in at about 1290. Now, that's a really, really early age for an Irish castle. We can accept the Norman castles, and we know from the history where the Normans were, but the Normans weren't at Dangany Viggan, but the Irish were by 1290 copying what the Normans were doing and creating stone structures for their own security and defence. Now, the great thing about the sample, I, I, the sampling I did in Daniel Vigan, I carried out three different sampling um, exercises over the three years and uh, over about two and a half years. Uh, two were uh, twigs and one was martyr. And they came in within five years of each other. So I can be very That's certain. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and two, different, two different types of samples, but also two different universities in two different parts of the world came back with uh, the same date to within about five years. That's about as conclusive as you're going to get, I think. Oh, that's as conclusive as you'll get, yeah. 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 So we know that some sections of that castle were built prior to 1300, 1295, 1298 or thereabouts. It's fascinating. So that's our, our earliest, yeah. And uh, no. I know that your your main like uh, passion is for the castles in Clare, your hometown, and you, you mentioned that there was around 250 in, in, in that county alone. Um, about 225, 230, yeah. 225, yeah. Well, still, it's significant. Um, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about your research there. Um, yeah. I know you have some some images there as well. Yeah, well, if, if we look at the, if we look at the, um, the castles in County Clare, if you look at the castles in any county and you look at the population of castles and where they're located, you will always find that they're heavily concentrated in areas of, of productive land. Because land and product, productive land was a value because you could feed cattle, and as we know, cattle were the currency. The, obviously, there was some precious metals like gold and, and stuff, but the regular currency for, for, for barter and for trade, cattle was, was the big thing. And you were measured, your wealth was measured in your cattle. So therefore, your land, if your land was, was good and valuable, you defended it, number one. And number two, uh, it was also your, your income. On a, on a small scale. And when you look at the size of the townlands in County Clare, and you look at the size of the McNamara Territory in Southeast Clare, they're small townlands. And if you look at the townlands in West Clare, where the land is very poor and rushy and, and boggy, they're huge, big townlands because the amount of land that was required to raise cattle and to keep a family was in East Clare, because East Clare has fantastic. And it's the same as you go down to the Golden Vale in Munster, and I mean, th this is what people fought over, land, and it still goes on. But land and its quality is um, very visible when we look at the castle population. Very, very visible. Now, I can pull up, uh, I can pull up a slide of that if this might show. Yeah, if we look at, um, if we look at the castle population there, so you can see Northwest County Clare has a good pop population of castles. 
and southeast. So down at the bottom right hand corner southeast, that's uh, McNamara Territory. And northwest then is the Burn and O'Loughlin and O'Connor Territory. So when we look at when we look at um, how these were um, situated, we can look at the value of the land and then we look at the families that live there. And I mean, if we wanted to talk about the families of, uh, of the tower houses, that's a, a complete other evening because you, you had the McNamaras and you had the O'Briens who were the dominant clans, who were the most important people and, and, and they held the wealth. They, 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 were, they were the overlords. And until 1543, when, um, when the Irish submitted to Henry VIII over in Greenwich and gave up their titles of uh, Kings of Ireland or Kings of Munster or the Chieftain in County Clare, and they, they took on a title known as the Earls. So they were, the, they were no longer the Kings of Munster, but they were the Earls of Thomond, which was great for the O'Briens when the O'Briens took that over because um, they now paid a rent for Thomond to Henry VIII and their people paid the rent to the Earls, so the money went to England. But when the Earl died, his son was the next Earl. It was no longer going to be an election from the tarnished or the, 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 the next in line through the clans. So it was now within a family. So this caused yeah. huge wars, huge wars. People only realised that a generation after the, 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 the signing over of the land happened and, and, and it, it changed everything. It, it changed yeah. the entire face of Ireland. I'm not sure if you've seen this yourself, but I have a video up on the Brighton Academy YouTube channel um, where I read through the case of Tanistry. And you're hitting on that point there. I think that this notion of land ownership and title is absolutely central to the Irish story. Um, yeah. And it's, I think quite uh, it's often overlooked because you, you, you said it yourself, this primogeniture system that came with the Earl is that the title of Earl passed to the eldest born male, right? And so or all so. of the obligations and all of the contracts and the the duties that were owed to the crown passed down to the next person. But prior to that, it was very difficult for the crown to get a foothold in Ireland because maybe they make a deal with you, Martin, as chieftain of your sept. But when you passed, it didn't necessarily go to your son. So they had to kind of renegotiate and re um, get these people back into the fold each time. So that's why the case of Tanistry, in my opinion, is one of the most important aspects of understanding Irish, uh, the Irish story. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it, it caused so much bloodshed and war. And I mean, when we talk about an example of, of what we're talking about there with the primogeniture and the tenistry, once the O'Briens had signed over and became the Earls and the, and the wars started then within the clans. And then we had the colonizations where Henry and his um, followers, um, Elizabeth and the Tudor regime, will say they brought colonists into Ireland. And then within 100 years, up in 1640, then you see you had the, the, the Catholic rebellion. So the Catholics rose up and slaughtered the, the incoming um, settlers. Some, a lot of them died, some of them went back. And then when things got too hot, things got very hot then for the, the earls, and they hightailed it and they left and they went to England. So, I mean, this thing that I'm reading here now is this, this volume. I mean, it's full of what happened because uh, we'll say, just take the Earl of Tormund. He left in, 60, in the height of the rebellion in 1648. Uh, the, he, he went to England. He brought most of his manuscripts with him and they had bought a place in Great Billing, which is Northampton, Northamptonshire, which is north of London. And uh, it was a huge estate, very, very big estate. And um, they will say that was Barnabas the sixth Earl, and then his son was Henry the seventh Earl of Tormund. Now, his books, this book here, records, he was drawing his rents all the time, every year, annually, from all his lands in, in Ireland and going over to live the high life in England. So, Henry had another son then who was called Henry Horatio who died in his father's time, so he wasn't going to succeed. And Henry Horatio had just begotten a son who was Henry VIII Earl of Tormund. Henry VIII Earl of Tormund uh, was then the next Earl, but he was only seven or 
six or seven when he was became the Earl of Thomond. So the, the, to hold on to the entire Thomond estate, then he had to produce a son, but he, he produced no son. So there was no succession from the O'Briens on the entire Thomond estate. So that's all of all of County Clare, bits of Limerick, bits of Tipperary, Carlow, Dublin, Meath, all that land. And it suddenly just disappeared out of Irish hands because when Henry the Eighth Earl died in 1741, he was childless. His wife, Catherine Seymour, had a sister who was married into high society in England. She had a boy. And that's how the O'Brien estate passed onto his wife's sister's son, Henry um, Percy Wyndham. And the entire estate then was uh, amalgamated with the Wyndham estates. And that is Petworth House and Petworth Estate today. Um, it was a larger estate and there was a lot of other um, estates in, 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 involved in it. But that's, in a nutshell, that's where uh, all of the ownership of the O'Brien Earl of Thomans um, and the clan lands disappeared and uh, ended up being part of an English estate. That's that's, uh, that's the O'Brien side that's of it. That's just one chapter of Irish history that repeats that's only, again and yeah. again and again. Yeah, you know? and that's only personal to one family, but that happened everywhere. It yeah. happened everywhere. And, uh, and it was, as you said, because the primogeniture took over, so the clan lands no longer belonged to the clans, it belonged to the Earl and then his progeny. But not to the not to the people, and as as you can understand, it caused so much emotion and so much bloodshed and war, and I mean that's that's why our, our history was from 1540 up to up to today. Yeah. You could say maybe up to 1920, but it's it's still ongoing. It's still there. And this uh, importance of the land is something that um, I've heard said, and I've I've observed observed it myself. It's something that's still very central to Irish identity, where Irish people are some of the, the the highest rate of homeowners in in Europe. Yeah. You'll find in yeah. Ireland a lot of continental countries would have a lot more renters, people who rent their yeah. com- their properties, and it's something that's very ingrained in our blood because we have this ancestral memory of the land being snatched from us or these sorts of arrangements that you've just mentioned. There is yeah. another one that I can recall, John O'Donoghue, who you said this phrase at the start. If I can see far from here, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. He is a man mm. whose shoulders I stand firmly on. Uh, and he yeah. tells the story about how um, there was Irish family. I can't remember who, who it was, but they had emigrated to the UK. And he could only inherit the land if he took his uncle's name, which was a British name. So he changed his name over from an Irish clan name to a British name just so he could inherit. Because yeah. Do you know what that is? Who is it? Do you know? Do you know who we're talking about? Who we're, ta- we're talking about the same family. We are. <laughs> the guy, the guy, the guy, and I'll tell you exactly what it is. The guy that I told you that inherited from Henry the Seventh Earl of Thomond in seventeen forty one. His name was Percy Wyndham. He had to become Percy Wyndham O'Brien. I see. See, so that's that, probably where you're. You're probably triggering that memory the, there. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. He had to. He had. That was part of the will. Of the of the of the Earl of Thomond, that's um, the successor or the remainder. Uh, Percy Wyndham uh, became the, the owner in remainder because there was nobody else available. And I'm reading through it here at the moment, and I can see where they had hoped that the successor to the Earl of Thomond would go back, back up three generations and down the other side uh, to the Dromore O'Briens. And strangely enough. The guy who was to succeed was drowned and he died about the same time as the Earl. So when there was no one else in remainder, the Earl's nephew, Percy Wyndham, provided he adopted the Irish name. So he became Percy Wyndham O'Brien. I see. And, That's where the, came and the castles in Clare, like, what, why is there so many of them? Was it a case of different branches of the family or different, you know, people from these families with a certain amount of prestige? It was a mark of status to have a castle, so this is why so many yeah. people were building their own. Yeah, yeah, they were they were a status symbol, absolutely, and they're run in families. So I mean, the families associated in County Clare with the castles are number one would be the O'Briens, followed by the McNamaras, followed then by the uh, McMahons in Southwest Clare, and in Northwest Clare you had the O'Connors, 
and you had your Lachlans. So that's that's just five of the main families. But outside of that, then you also had castles in the hands of the learned people or the literati. So these were the people, the scribes and the, the, the service, the service providers, the academic yeah. service providers to the earls. So the, I mean the, the clerks, the, the, king, the, the doctors and yes, the lawyers. That's, that's and, what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, you had the doctors who were the O'Hickeys, the O'Hickeys and the O'Neillands, the, the those two families. Well, in County Clare, O'Hickeys and Neelands had, had the castles. Uh, uh, then you had and just, the just on that point, just North, before yeah. you move on, I want to mention because there is still a chain of pharmacies in Ireland that are called that are have the name of Hickeys above it, even to this day. You'll really? find pharmacies with Hickeys, yeah. And the name comes from O'Hickey H H I C E A, which is translates directly from the Irish into English is known as the healer. Really? I didn't Ike, know that. Ike is to heal. The healer. Yeah. yeah. And take another another member of the, 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 the names of, of the of the trade of the person followed them. So you've come across the name Klahasi. Yes. Oklochasuk. And Klahasi back to the Irish is Oklochasuk and Kloch is stone. That's right. Yeah, so there are stonemasons, right? There were stonemasons, and in Ennis, up to my time in going to school in the 1970s, there was classy stonemasons, and they were, they were still there. And, and there's actually there's actually on one, the castle is no longer there, but the dedication plaque for the building of the castle, uh, it was a castle in Liston Verna. It was built by Dennis Classy, AD 1614, and it's Dennis C-L-O-C-H-E. Yeah. So they, they, were, they were the... The classes. One of the projects I'm working on at the moment um, is on the origin and meaning of Irish family names. And there's yes. an interesting part where he talks about how at a certain period in Irish history, there was uh, a lot of Anglicization of Irish names. So mm -hmm. you have the name Carpenter, for example, which in Irish be Mac and Sir, which is the yeah. son, the son of the Sir, the, the free man, but it meant the craftsman. Uh, yeah, the sayer, well, you see, the sayer, the sayer covers a lot of crafts. Yeah, people and who were not uh, in, in, uh, in dependent upon a lord for their service. Or yeah, their they skill. Could, so they could travel freely and ply their wares, which was their, their skills. So, I mean, you had the typical example is the Goban sayer, and he was, the, he was the original Freemason. That's right. You know, yeah, that's you know, so uh, it is a terribly interesting study what you're talking about, what yeah. you're looking into. And the Gabons the, the, the became, origin of, of they, they became the Gowans, and uh, okay. also known as like McGowan. And McGowan, interestingly, yeah. when they anglicized their surname, they anglicized it to Smith, which makes Smith. Which makes sense. Yeah. And one of the, my the favorite Smith, ones yeah. is uh, the Wards, the Ward family, oh, which Ward. is. Macron Ward, and it's a proud old name to have if you're saying that I'm the son of the Bard. So there's a yeah, really yeah. fascinating also, study there as well. You also had the you also had the, the, the sons of the clergy. The cleric was that the clerics or what? The clergy, what? yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 Taggart, Taggart. Macon Taggart, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Son of son of the priest mm. and uh, Macaneski. Oh, the is, is 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 a bishop, right? Macaneski, yeah. The, yeah, son the, the son of the bishop. But that was yeah. a fair. You were a fair. You were a fair man off. You were a son of the bishop, but yeah. You were <laughs> That's what you wanted see, to if hold we go that back, title. If if we go back, if we go back to the maybe the 13th century, 12th, 13th, 14th century, when the likes of the abbots, uh, the abbots were as powerful in those times as almost as the earls, yeah. because you know they provided a service. They also provided a stepping stone for these people to go to heaven. So if 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 the earl or the not the earls at the time if the king endowed the abbey, and put in a new glass window or whatever, so he was going to get his burial place in the centre, two steps from the altar. So in theory, he was only a few steps from heaven when he died. Yeah, you know, but I mean the power the power of of the clergy, and that's what happened. I mean, the new the the, the, the clergy became too powerful, and then they got married. And then when they were being mar married, they were having children. So suddenly then the, the land lands that were belonged to the, the church yeah. were going into children and into the family. So then what happened then, if you read, if you read the ecclesiastical history and you look through the, um, the great synods, the synod, the, the, there was four great synods in, in the 12th century. The, the, the main purpose of the synods was to take the power of 
the, the these habits. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. So the power of inheritance, and then they, they stopped. Yeah, they could no longer get married and all that kind of thing. To the yeah. oh my god, to the it's a good story. But that's that's the name. Well, that's the religious names of and. You know, when you start looking into it, you could be you could be talking about it for months. Well, There's a lot of material a, there. A few of the main veins of Irish history, which is the land, uh, the, the it's a status, the family ties, and now the church as well. And I feel mm. like we could spend a few hours packing unpacking any one of these topics. I mean haven't spent a lot of time on, on the castles in Clare and that's fine too. I mean, really enjoying the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We've about five yeah, minutes or yeah. so left. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so yeah, I just want to give you a chance if there, if there is like particular topic that you wanted us to cover in the last few minutes, now would be a, a good time for that. No, I think we, we've covered most of them. I mean, uh, what you could, what we could look at uh, as well is, is um, methods of research. And as I said to you, the, 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 the research has become a lot easier for us uh, in the last 10 years uh, because the likes of, of, of um, academia and um, there's, there are several sites there for historical research that will actually give you the book, flip through it online and you can search it. So that instead of spending a week looking for a reference in a, in a volume of 600 pages, uh, you can just student uh, best for the stuff that's 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 published it's the unpublished material uh, where most of our, our secrets and most of our our, our uh, research um, our research time is spent because that is worth spending time on because it's stuff that is not available and it's stuff that the likes of the manuscript stuff i've i've worked with several different manuscripts over the years and you, you get stuff out of those that hasn't been uh, to the fore in the past and so therefore it's new original research and it's new it's new information for people and you add it to whichever file you're you're on whether it is on castles or churches or mcnamara's or whatever it's so just the, you know the there's so much stuff that, there how do you get your hand on the unpublished stuff because i'm always complaining about how much of our knowledge is still left to be um, discovered or translated and so on and I'm really curious for my own research. You know, how do you get your hands on some of these unpublished materials? I'm sure you've come across the, the, that Irish scripts on screen. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's quite an amount of stuff in that. But the, the, the other thing is, is, is it's time. Uh, you have to go to places like the Royal Irish Academy or... Trinity, a a or constant Rutland. reminder of our history that's been stolen. I always cringe when I hear the Royal Irish Academy because it's just a little room, a little I calling know. card from the colonizers. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the repository of some of the finest of our manuscripts. And I mean, there's a huge amount of our manuscripts in England as well, but we have quite a few of them in, in, in um, the Royal Irish Academy and in Trinity College and, and the other uh, university libraries. You know, so really, if you're talking about delving deep and going backwards into history to stuff that hasn't actually been exposed in the past or maybe has been exposed to somebody who went to the trouble of it, like John O'Donovan, people who read these manuscripts, uh, they haven't published everything that they read and we have to go back and revisit it. But I mean, you're really going back to revisit something that might be a page or five or ten pages or a hundred pages, as in this case. And you will come up with something that is like uh, one example in the tome manuscripts that I'm working on at the moment, and it comes back to the learned families, is that this uh, in, in this uh, book on page 64 of the book, I came across a reference which said that the castle of Finnevera and its lands went from whoever and was paying X amount of rent. And I said, wow, I knew there was a castle up there, but there's nothing on, on the ground. Yeah, there's wow. nothing on the map. From the earliest maps, the 16, uh, the, the uh, 1836 maps, the first Ardens maps. But when you go back one step further, back to the, to the down survey maps, there's a little, and I looked at it closely and it's faded, but there's a little castle there. And I went back up and I v visited. So really what we found is we found the castle of Finnevera, which was the castle of the O'Daly Coats. And the O'Daly Coats were, I mean, the bards and the poets, they were so powerful and they yep. held schools. And, and we have records of schools being held at Finnevera, but where was it being held? So we're saying, Amazing. well, 
obviously they lived in obviously they lived in some of the ring forts because looking at at their material this they're they're transferring land and uh, homesteads and the homestead included the cave under the home so this was the stew train in the in the ring fort and then when we move on to the medieval the later medieval on to maybe 16th century 15th 16th century we now have the reference to castle and this book here tells me yes that castle was in existence in 1680 i'd love I, to I have, have you back have on. another uh, again, because I feel like there's so much more yeah. you and I could talk about. This last 40 minutes or so has flown by. Yeah, oh, there's a lot. So quickly. There, there is a um, lot of stuff there. I guess like... Uh, all, I, I, all I'd say is, yeah. all, all I'd say there to you is it's a good job that we're not standing at a bar counter. Yeah. <laughs> because... Uh, and at least it's yeah. going to get out, you know, and that's that's really my mission with the Brehan yeah. Academy, yeah. as I said yeah. at the start. It's to try and take all of those... W- library of books you have behind you and condense it into mm. a, a medium that people are going to be uh, actually uh, uh, taking in these days which is like video and online content so well um, i mean the stuff you mentioned there before i go and i'll just say it to you uh, when we look at them um, when we look at publications so to get the stuff back out to the public again and i'm not pushing the books because they're almost gone that was the mcnamara book and that was the O'Brien book, which came to 600 pages, which is nearly gone as well. That was the little Bunratty book, which again is almost finished. And I I have retired, so I'm not doing any more of that. I'm now on research. And then you had Twig's um, McNamara book. So they, they were the they were the ones that, that weren't available to the public yeah. up to the year 2000. So they're there now for people. And you have some and, beautiful leather bound versions of that I've seen on your website. And I'll pop, I'll pop is, the um, website up here. Well, if people yeah. want to learn more and dive a bit deeper into your work, what's the best place to find your materials? On, under my own name.com, martinbreen.com. Martinbreen.com. Okay, I'm yeah. going to put that up. Martin, I wish we could talk for longer. Yeah. I'll, I'll be in touch with you and maybe we can do this again next month um, because there's so yeah. much that we can unpack from this. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for your time. There's a lot. Stuff, yeah, because we could we could we could break down any one of those topics and talk for an hour on them. But look, we will meet again. We'll chat again. And uh, thank you for for inviting me on it. Um, you know, I'm I'm delighted to share my my experience and my knowledge with, with people. And as I say, it's just uh, it's it's opportune that we're not standing at a bar counter because we've never. Had <laughs> well, you're very welcome, and thank you for your time again. It's it's been an absolute pleasure. Until we talk next time. And you too. Thanks very much, Kevin. Bye. 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 And there you have it, folks. That was Martin Breen, a uh, wealth of knowledge and information on early Ireland. And I feel like that conversation could have gone on for many more hours. I regret that I had to cut it short there. I had another appointment that I had to get to. I will have Martin back on the Brehan Academy in the future because I just noticed so much more that we can talk about. I really enjoyed that conversation and I hope hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, Before I go, just to invite you once again to check out the brehanacademy.org where you're going to find access to online courses, a member's library with over 100 books that you can search digitally and uh, go deep on your research into early Ireland. Also have an online store there. And also I would invite you to please share uh, videos from the Brehan Academy with your friends, anybody who you know is interested in these topics and help me to grow this channel. Until next time, Slán Gafal. Mm-hmm.